Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So let's talk about subtractive versus additive EQ today. So I might get a little more in depth here than I'm planning because that's what I tend to do with my YouTube videos lately, but let's see what happens here. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what subtractive EQ is and what additive EQ is. Okay, so this is my EQ plugin of choice right now. So it's the FabFilter Pro Q. And you might use a different EQ, but basically every EQ tends to have the same type of parameters in it, right? So we have on the X axis, we have frequency going from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the range of human hearing, roughly, right? And then on the Y axis, we have decibel level, right? So it starts at zero, this zero line right down the middle here. And you can either raise or lower that decibel level for whatever frequency band you're working on. So what I usually do with this plugin is I just go straight to the seven bands option here, and then I work from there. And that's just so I have a bunch of dots here for my different frequency bands. I don't have to hold command and click to add a point, right? That's why I do that. But basically when we're talking about additive EQ, what we're doing is we're raising a point here on the EQ graph. So it's basically when we're actually raising the levels. So we're going above the zero point into positive decibel range here on the EQ graph. When we're talking about subtractive EQ, we're doing the opposite. We're just bringing it below zero. So we're, we're attenuating the signal instead of augmenting it, right? So additive EQ, we're bringing up the signal and then subtractive EQ, we're bringing down the signal. And that's on the most basic level what additive EQ is and what subtractive EQ is. And you guys probably already understand this, even if it's just on an intuitive level. But if we're talking about both subtractive and additive EQ, then the general rule that people tend to use is that we boost wide and we cut narrowly. So what that means is we're talking about the Q value, right? So if we're cutting, it's going to be more narrow. And if we're boosting, it tends to be more wide, right? But that's just a general rule. It's not like most things in audio, it's not a hard and fast rule that you have to obey, right? So on an intuitive level, I personally, I get this most easily because I know that we don't wanna take a super narrow notch filter and then flip that to make it a boost because that just tends to sound really bad. Like it sounds horrible. Like you can go ahead and try it. It sounds really bad. But if we think about why that is, it's really just because if we crank up one tiny section of the frequency spectrum, it then sticks out to us. Whereas if we cut it, for example, uh, we are just predisposed to noticing that negative space. So that tells us a lot more about how we as humans perceive sound, I think. And it doesn't really tell us as much about the tool, the EQ, right? And just because we tend to use this tool this way does not mean that subtractive EQ is inherently more accurate than additive EQ. And that's what some people tend to argue is that it's more accurate. But I think that's just because we tend to use it in a more quote unquote accurate way, a more honed in way when we're doing subtractive EQ. So people argue a lot about which is better, and I personally prefer subtractive EQ, and I'll tend to use it more, but I do think that a lot of the arguments for and against it are fairly outdated or not really rooted in valid science or data. So I think it's okay to use either one, and I think there's a time and a place to use each. So I think the most important thing to do here is to make sure that your gain staging is good while you're using either one. So that's why, for example, when it's not obvious to me which one I should use, I'll tend to use subtractive EQ. And that's because then I don't have to worry about boosting the signal while using additive EQ and accidentally clipping the track or causing clipping farther down in my signal chain. And you know, that's one of the arguments that people use in favor of subtractive EQ. So it doesn't eat up the headroom on your tracks. But as long as you keep an eye on that and you don't clip and you compensate for any imbalances in your mix that arise from your EQ changes, I don't think it really matters if you use subtractive or additive EQ. Just don't be irresponsible about your gain staging. But you know, it might depend on what plugins or gear you're using and what you're working on or doing. So for example, one argument for subtractive EQ is that additive EQ messes with your sound because it uses active gain. But this is based on old information and on very old EQ hardware. And most EQs used today in studios don't have the setup anymore. So it's not exactly a wrong argument originally, but it's kind of a moot point. It's usually gonna be a moot point. And of course, if you're using a plug-in EQ, then it's all the more irrelevant. Another argument that people use in favor of subtractive EQ is that it doesn't cause as much phase shift, but most EQs nowadays don't cause much phase shift, not in that sense. But I mean, if you're concerned, you can actually test it out with whatever EQ you're using. So a bunch of people online have done tests involving running the same signal out to two different tracks. So what they do is they have one of the tracks with an EQ shelf that's boosted on one end of the 
the frequency spectrum. And then on the other track, they then make an identical EQ shelf that's cut on the other end of the frequency spectrum. So if you then match the levels on those two tracks and then phase flip one of them, you should notice that it's canceling itself out. If your parameters match up equally, then they should completely cancel each other out, which means that with everything else held constant, boosting or cutting is not what is causing any phasing issues with EQ. So there's also the idea that subtractive EQ sounds better or smoother, but people that make these arguments don't really seem to have an objective test that can prove this from what I've seen. But you know, let me know in the comments if you have one. I'm completely open to being wrong. But yeah, I think people tend to think it sounds better because if you use additive EQ when subtractive would have worked better, you can often find yourself trying to boost everything else to match the thing you just EQ'd. And that might cause you to push your mix to somewhere that it didn't need to be. So that might make it sound more rough or harsh. And in this type of situation, you might have just been boosting everything because you wanted a certain frequency to be quieter in comparison. So it would have been a lot simpler and easier, right, to reduce that one frequency range instead. So I personally think it's more important to learn to understand what sound you actually want and the most efficient way to reach that sound than it is to try to pick subtractive or additive EQ and stick with it. I think subtractive and additive EQ each have their own time and place to use them. And it's just as important to get used to the idea that you can use either one if need be, right? So basically don't get tunnel vision on only using one of them. So yeah, that's about it for today. Um, just get out there and have fun EQing. I hope this helped some of you guys, so let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, if you like this video, please hit the like button, consider subscribing to my channel, hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I come out with a new video. And if you wanna support this channel more directly, I do have a Patreon, so it's patreon.com slash noise. And my patrons do get access to additional content, and I'm always working to add more content to that Patreon page for my patrons. I really appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. So yeah, that's it. I come out with new videos every Wednesday and thanks for watching. Okay.